This used to be one of the most beautiful areas in the South Bronx. New immigrants in the tenements on the Lower East Side dreamed of the day they would move here. The streets were wide and clean, and the buildings had central heating and indoor plumbing. For years, the neighborhood saw successive waves of Irish, Italian, and Jewish immigrants. New York was a growing city then, and they quickly found their place in it. But as the times changed, the dream faded. This neighborhood would survive the Great Depression, but it could not survive the Long Island Expressway. New highways made the suburbs accessible, while low-cost federally insured mortgages made them affordable. Young families began leaving the old neighborhood. At first, the empty apartments were filled by a new wave of middle-class blacks and Hispanics. But unknown to them, the forces that would destroy this neighborhood were already in motion. Housing in the area was aging and in need of renovation. But with rents frozen at wartime levels, landlords could only afford minor repairs. Banks and insurance companies hastened the decay by redlining the area. The insurance coverage and bank loans essential to the survival of the neighborhood were first difficult and then impossible to obtain. The neighborhood deteriorated rapidly now as block after block was vacated. Local politicians abandoned the area in order to follow their longtime constituents. Political boundaries were redrawn almost every year, leaving the South Bronx with little effective representation. The city began to use the South Bronx as its dumping ground. It created a welfare ghetto by flooding the area with welfare families and then cutting back on city services. The final blow came in 1968 with the opening of Co-op City, a large government subsidized apartment development in the North Bronx. This drained off the last of the original tenants who took with them the last semblance of stability. Within five years, the neighborhood was in ruins, either burned by the landlords for the insurance money or burned by the welfare tenants themselves who hoped to be placed in a better neighborhood, where usually the same destructive cycle was already in progress. <laughs> Well, Simpson Street is a dirty block. It's no good. This cop, he wrote a book. He wrote a, he wrote a book about the 40 Apaches. That's the 41 precinct on Simpson Street. What was it like where you grew up? Was it rural? Um, yes, well, it was in the country, you know, rural part. Nice place to raise children. In fact, my mother told me I was going to have so many children that she shouldn't take them to the city because the city was no place to raise children. But you find that's pretty true in a sense, you know. I came there at the age of two. Lived in the basement for a while with my grandparents. From there, we lived there for about eight years. Then my, that's when the, everything went wrong. Everything all of a sudden just, the whole building just went down. One little fire. There was never a fire there. And that one fire did it. I, I was still working here when the building was starting to go down. I was working at the, I, I had a job at Casita Maria. I was going to Manhattan College at the time. And I had, I left Casita for about two years. 
Uh, you know, I got married, I had a, another full-time job, so I, and during those two years, the whole neighborhood, I don't know, you know, when I, when I came back, the buildings across the street were gone, buildings, you know, like just the building on this, on the block over here on the corner, the, the professional building was one of the, one of the prettiest buildings in the Bronx, and it was just total. But it has been like this for the last five years. So you must be me like six, seven years ago. It was a very, very fun place to live. It was a spirit, you know, like in the, in the radius of these four blocks, it was a spirit of people, knowing people, loving people, people just living together. But because you didn't have as much fighting and gangs and all that, then you had a lot of unity among the people themselves. Like uh, people, did, even though it was a lot of um, robberies and stuff of that sort, many people didn't lock their doors because you knew me and I knew you and nobody, the junkies knew us, <laughs> so they didn't bother. And when when I was coming up, the thing was junkies taking needles and everything. That's how it was. The buildings and everything were up. You just see the men on the roof, you know, putting shooting dope in their arms and stuff like that. Now you hardly see that. I can hardly see any buildings, neither. That's how it is. What happened to the junkies? They went along right with the buildings when they knocked them down or they burnt them down. That's how it went. Before they got tore down, you know, and they got burnt one by one, we used to, as they got burnt down, we played in them. Like when they was a bandit, we ran up and down in them, played games like Ring Levia, Round Up, a bunch of friends, Mike, Stevie. KK, all of them, Irving and them, running around, up and down and them, playing games. You know, it was fun, but then junkies started hanging out, you know. You know, kids got scared to be out at late at night. You know, the parents kept their kids off the street. They got them off early, you know. People wasn't out long enough, like, you know, for a long amount of time. And, um, what else? I wish they fix it quick, because my, mo my mother wants to move in, my grandparents, everybody wants to move back in. And my grandfather's trying to get the super's job again, but I doubt it, he's too old. This, was, this used to be my nickname a couple of years back. Um, this is what's left of my hobby, my favorite hobby, pigeons. This is all that's left of the pigeon coop, though, even though the pigeons are still here. They still come back here. They come to visit every once in a while, I guess. Every time I come in here, they always in here. I'll take you up to the roof in a while, show you what I had. Well, the super started arguing, so I put them inside my room. The lady downstairs started arguing, so I had to get rid of them once and for all. Mm -hmm. And I regret it, because, I mean, every time I used to have a problem, I would I'd stay with my pigeons and forget about my problems. See, around here, I mean, years back, it was a lot different than now. A lot. It was more fun. I mean, fun stops as you get older. They just tell you that we destroy our own neighborhoods. If I live in a building, I'm not gonna burn the building because I got the little shit I hustled for to be in there. I don't want to burn. My mother and father lived here since they were kids. I lived here when I was a kid. And now you're going to tell me, go move someplace else. What for? I live here. I know at one time, they were just about to pass the, these buildings on uh, 163rd Street, the SEDCO proposal. And at that time, Roger Starr made a statement that the city plans on allowing the South Bronx to burn down and just just leave it eventually to developers. Just let it run its course. Um, I live right down the block on Tiffany Street, which no longer exists. My roots here are practically all taken out. They're all burnt out. The school that I went to, the grammar school, is now an empty lot. But Casita still remains, you know, and it's, it's, it's something that this neighborhood needs. Because actually, Casita right now is the heart of the neighborhood I mean, for, the, for the kids coming up. And if, if we can help the kids around here, the kids will help the neighborhood. They'll find out that they need the neighborhood and they'll be working harder to help it. In some ways it's getting better because, you know, all the bad people that used to live around here, like, that wasn't all like close to us, 
they're going, but some of our old friends are going too. You know, and the way it's getting, not getting that good. Nothing to do. They're not building nothing. They said they was gonna build for about four or five years. They've been saying that something like that. All they built was the schooling. And that's not even no place to go. Only place we have to go is Casita. That's where everybody hang out mostly now. Without well, Casita, it's hard to say. If 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 Casita would have burned down today, it would definitely leave a big vacuum. Oh, well, that's not really fair either. Because if Casita burned down today, we'd be running street programs, probably. Um, if Casita never came into the area in the first place, the area would definitely be suffering. That's not to glorify ourselves, you know, because Casita Marine is a community center. I mean, the people there run it. The community center is really dependent on the people there. If the people don't want the center there, it's not going to be there. with each other and stop them like that. You know, when I bring the gloves out, let them put the gloves on. You know, let them box it. They get the angry out of them, you know. They take all the, you know. And that way they learn, you know, learn to be friends more, you know, not to argue, not to fight each other, not to fuss. We can get Tony not to argue playing ball. That's the only thing wrong with him. He's a bad loser. <laughs> he want to win all the time. He's been so used to winning, I guess it's hard for him to lose. Right? You plan to stay in this neighborhood? Nah, I hope not. I don't want to. Let's move somewhere else. I'm tired of the city. South Bronx, anyway. What do you think will happen here in the next few years? Probably be the same. They said for the last seven years, it's supposed to be projects up there. To no avail. Nothing happened. Probably be the same. These will probably be knocked down. Just gotta wait and see. So I'm just gonna have to make up my mind after I get out of school. After I get out of school, after I get my high school diploma, I don't mind because I can leave for the Navy. That's what I've always wanted to. If I couldn't become a vet, I wanted to go go, go to the Navy. I don't know, I, I've always I've always wanted, since I was small, I've always wanted to become a veterinarian. But um I guess my grades in school wasn't high enough to go into veterinary school. So that blew my whole thing. Wait. That's what I've always wanted to become. How come I come back here? I, I can't go anywhere else. <laughs> I've grown up here. I see my I see my roots burning. I see everything down. Uh, my building just went down a couple of uh, months ago. There's nothing here. And I, I, I grew up here. This place has helped me become what I am. And I'm just not going to abandon it, you know. I would like a clean neighborhood. And I would like all these burnt out buildings built, tore down and rebuilt. And I would like people to stop littering down the back of us so I don't have to sweep that much. Grandma, and I like people grandma. to stop throwing stuff down 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 the hallway so I don't have to sweep that much either. Grandma, and, and I would like people to stop busting glass around here because people can get hurt when, 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 when other people bust glass. These here are local residents who will be doing most of the work on the garden. Right, ladies and gentlemen? 
Yes. And this is the undertaker. Lamb car guy, hang on all the fifty. Right on. What's going on? Well, I've got you too. Let's get a hold of it. Um, this is more or less the garden itself. Um, we're trying to wait for them to do these buildings over or um, give them to somebody on a sweat equity program and seal them up before we really get serious down here with the garbage. Are we supposed to put up with all this garbage? Look, bricks, concrete, and garbage being dumped. What happened? They didn't fence it off. They could knock down a building anyway and come dump bricks in there. Who's going to sell them anything? When they knocked down the building over there, they had bricks all over here. They didn't clean it up. We cleaned it up. We tried. We tried to get money from the city to renovate a building, to try to fix it up, make it livable for more of our people that were forced out of the block because there was no place to live. What's the city say? You got red tape. Two, three years, maybe. Two, three years, there might not be a Kelly Street. They might burn this whole thing down. What are we supposed to do in two, three years? There won't be nothing here for us. And we want it. The South Bronx got the worst housing in the whole goddamn state. Why can't we take a little of this money and put it back in here? We, hey, you got buildings that have beautiful structures and they're just being demolished. But if you start somewhere, if you build Kelly Street and then you build Intervale and then you build Beck, you, people start seeing improvement and working. And the people who work in the buildings live in the buildings and rent in the buildings. They're all there. So then they don't want, they don't just want one square block looking nice. Because we don't only want to rebuild Kelly Street, we want to rebuild the neighborhood. Because if we destroy what we got here, they're just going to build it up. And where are we going to be? What are we going to have? Nothing. We're going to be in the same boat. Maybe a couple of projects around with little green grass that the kid runs on and the guy gives him a ticket for. And we don't want that. We want to stay the way we are. We want just the neighborhood better. All right, we do these three buildings and it comes out beautiful, we're off the ground. But we can't do nothing because we're too poor to take money out of our pockets to do it. Who are we gonna take it? $3,000 a unit for a building? Hey, that's a lot of money. I know we ain't talking in pennies, but we're not talking in millions like everybody else is. You put a proposal in, hey, yeah, this proposal ain't no good, it's not worded right. What do we know? We're not technicians, we're nothing. We're just common people, we have knowledge, and we know we could put that building together, but we ain't got a piece of paper that says we can do it. So they don't want to hear our plea. We're not asking for nothing personally. We're asking for it as a group. Not as savages, not as ghettos, not as Negroes, not as black, as people. Just being people. We want better police protection. We want better city cooperation. All we ask for them is get the wheel going now. In fact, we purchased that building across the street from the city. I don't know how in the world we're going to get it together, but we ain't going to try. See, we hope the city don't give up on us. See, we hope enough responsible people, you know, come around and try and get something going to make it. I don't believe they would really give up. In 1969, the city drew up a master plan for the renovation of the South Bronx. Federal and state monies were poured in, Signs were raised, and whole blocks were leveled to make way for the new construction. It never came. Scandals and mismanagement plagued the programs, and changing administrations brought with them new priorities. In 1973, President Nixon put a freeze on federal funds for city housing. As the flow of federal money stopped, the city adopted the attitude of many of the landlords it cut back on all essential services and, in effect, abandoned the area. Come on! <laughs> Keep on going. Come on the way. Right into me. Stop. 
stop. Now you stop. You stop there. Let's go. 